the Transworld Airlines for 14 years where he started as an instructor in flight operations and teaching meteorology regulations and flight procedures in their Kansas City Training Center. Mr. Ike earned a Bachelor of Science degrees from the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in, in Aeronautical Studies and from the Florida State University in Meteorology. He holds a commercial pilot certificate with an instrument rating aircraft dispatcher and weather observer certificates. Welcome, Don Ikes. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the morning special aviation weather. Like uh, I mentioned, my name is Don Ike. The last name is spelled E-I-C-K, but it's pronounced just like I-K-E, like we like Ike. Uh, at the end of this program, you all be saying the same thing. But, but one of the things we're going to be looking at this morning is this is going to be a fast-paced course. So bear with me. I will be happy to answer your questions afterwards. Um, but our main purpose here is trying to improve general aviation safety. Um, just a quick review. We're going to be looking at some of the accident statistics, kind of see where we are now, look at our main weather threat areas, uh, concentrating here we are in Florida on thunderstorms, making weather-wise decisions, pre-flight planning, obtaining updates, weather in the cockpit and weather related accidents. So a uh, full bag here. And again, this is gonna be a fast action pace, guaranteed not to put you to sleep. But if you noticed last year in 2014, for part 91, we had over 1200 accidents. Where again, we were talking substantial damage, serious injury or fatality in part 91. 252 of those accidents were fatal with a total of about 417 fatalities. That's still pretty high. Um, part 91 accounted for about 51% of all the flying time, but 97% of all the fatalities. So we have a big area of improvement here in weather related accidents occur for one of the highest percentage of those fatalities. So when you're talking about fatal accidents, likely environmental factors is playing a part to it. Now, if we look at straight numbers from 2000 to 2014, here's the trend of the number of Part 91 accidents. Now, overall, you'll notice in the big green line on the top with the yellow trend line, overall, how are we doing? We're doing great. Accidents are coming down. Uh, the fatal accidents are in red and again, total fatalities, but you notice they're kind of like flat line there. We haven't really seen major improvements there. And if you look at just the number of accidents, it shows that we are seeing a decreasing trend that we're getting better. However, can be deceiving. If we look at the number of flight hours, uh, we see that general aviation flying is actually down the last several years. And this uh, slide right here kind of basically shows the bottom line is under Part 91, we have corporate aircraft. So we got the, our jets and so forth. And you notice that line is flatlined, basically one of the best safety records. We start talking about business aviation, again, good equipment, ATP pilots, instrument rated, well-maintained. Yeah, relatively flatlined and the accidents there. Yellow about flight instruction for all our um, different events from going your private, your commercial, your instrument, overall the decreasing trend. The top line is the critical one. This is personal flying, i.e., how many people flew into the air show this, this week? Well, that's you, personal flying. And you'll notice overall the rate is actually increasing. Personal flying accidents are actually by the rate looking at flight hours, it's actually been increasing, not decreasing. The numbers are going down, but that's because we're not flying as often. So we still have a concern here. Accidents still are occurring and we wanna reduce those. Now in 2008, the NTSB switched over to the commercial aviation safety team, the CAS description of accidents. So when you start looking at how we categorize our accidents right now, you're going to notice that we've got a big push on loss of control in flight and on the ground. Number one cause of our accidents right now is loss of control. Now think about that. Weather's tied into that, but it can be also the uh, turning short on final, uh, exceeding the critical angle of attack, uh, stall speed, when we stall an airplane. They're bed in there too. 
Systems components, specifically with a power plant, number two, and again, carburetor-racing is a, a big one in here. Control, flight, and the train, and CFIT. Now, when you hear the term CFIT, do you see the ground? Predominantly, in these accidents, you don't see the ground. So we're talking about IFR flying, shooting the approach, and all of a sudden, boom, we're hitting the ground. So weather is embedded in that category. Uh, collision with terrain and objects can be weather in, involved, otherwise maybe night flight and so forth, VFR and IMC conditions, system component, not power plant related, the bottom of the list, but again, we still see significant accidents there. In the accidents we deal with, we look at the man-machine environment, and they're all related one way or another. Now, this is a slide I created uh, back in 2012. Um, it's it's all the accidents, part 91, from 2000 to 2011. During this period, we had over 19,000 part 91 accidents. We started digging into the probable cause, contributing factors, almost 30% of those accidents, 29% specifically, had weather as a cause or a factor tied to it. Think about that. 30% of our accidents, weather related. Now, if we look at the causes of this weather, we see the number one cause, adverse winds, about 52%. Next major category, low ceilings, visibility, obscurations, big impact at 13%. We go down the line, density, altitude, carburetor icing, 6%. Then we start talking about structural icing, thunderstorms, turbulence, wind shear. You notice those are relatively small numbers. But when you start looking at averages, like what is 3% of these accidents that we're looking at? Well, if you look at our current average, looking at 10-year average ending in 2014, we average 1,500 accidents a year. 280 fatal events, about 500 fatalities. If we just look at 29% of those being weather-related, that's about 435 accidents a year. Oh, geez, what's 3%? We're talking about maybe 14 encounters with thunderstorms a year. That's still pretty high. We want to reduce those. Now, adverse winds is the number one factor. What are we talking about? Um, high wind gusts, uh, variable winds, crosswinds, tailwinds, uh, wind gusts, wind shifts. You could even say thunderstorm outflows and things like that. And we're going to show you some examples of that. But let me take you to a, a, an example of this. And for those who are looking at the slides, uh, you'll notice on my slides, I've got the NTSB case number on the top, the location, the aircraft type, and the date. If you want to go into our database, you can quickly search any one of those parameters. You can get the whole files, pictures, and everything uh, free of access in our document system at ntsb.gov. Um, well, in this particular case, it's a Part 91 personal flight. We're going from Cameron Park, California, elevation 1287. This is right in the San Joaquin Valley, just to the east of Sacramento. Flying community, beautiful, you know, house there, garage, hangar, beautiful area, nice place to live. And here we have a couple going out. We only have one runway at the airport, runway 1331. Notice the length, 4,050 feet. 50 feet wide, yeah, it's okay. 12.35, we're leaving right after noon. Current conditions, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. Variable winds. Now, he's used to taking off 100 degree days, no major problems, good aircraft, a bonanza. This day, density altitude, yeah, about 4,000 feet. Now, does that seem really excessively high? A little bit higher than Florida. But you think of Denver and Tennessee and all the western states, does that seem excessively high density altitude? Yeah, not really. But again, the environment's going to play its role. Here in this day, we have full fuel. Top it off. We've got a pilot, three passengers, two couples, and of course, they're just like me, a little bit a little above average, if you will. Full bags. And guys... Is eight pairs of shoes normal for a weekend getaway? Don't argue. Happy wife, happy life. We got full bags. 
full bags, full fuel, four people. Weight and balance issues. Well, no formal weight and balance is performed. I know my airplane, and I'm sure everyone knows that, yeah, I know my normal weight and so forth. I'm going to be within limits. In this case, we're getting near the edge. Now, takeoff distance to clear a 50-foot obstacle, plus adding the 30% factor for our density altitude for payload, I need 4,030 feet to take off. I'm legal, right? It's a balanced field. I got runway length is shorter than the, the actual runway. So I'm legal to go, right? Well, I got so how many people feel comfortable with this? Okay, so we got some options. Maybe you should have been planning to take off earlier in the morning, lower density altitude and so forth. Well, it just so happens there was a news crew filming that day to kind of show the lifestyle of the, the flying community and they captured the uh, video of the airplane taking off. Here it is. Now, at the time of takeoff, 96 degrees, we actually have a right quartering crosswind and tailwind component. We get airborne. Please try to get out of ground effect. Oh, we don't seem to want to get airborne here. And boom, we have an accident. Now, what's sad about this, most take off adverse wind scenarios, they're not typically fatal. In this case, it was. Uh, when you hit a boulder and displace it, you notice you just ripped the whole airplane apart. So here we have a beautiful weekend getaway, nice couples, husband and wife team. We have two fatal and two serious injury in a ruined airplane. This is adverse winds, can be subtle, but all these things comb combination, man, machine, environment, interacting, again, something we could have avoided, but again, these things occur. Let's go down local here. Here's uh, DeLand, Florida, Cessna 152, August, a summer day, 21st in 2012. It's a maintenance flight. We just worked on the engine, got it going. We're going to the local pattern, uh, local practice area, back to the pattern. We're going to take off at 1510. Notice once we're airborne, there are storms approaching, thunderstorms. We decide to return to the field on final approach. It becomes unstable. Winds are increasing with turbulence. We go around, full power, angle of attack increase, ground aircraft is still being pushed down, impacts the runway hard, comes to rest inverted. Substantial damage, what's the probable cause? Failure to maintain aircraft control on final approach and gusting wind conditions. Contributing to accidents, the decision to operate in an environment of thunderstorms and rapidly deteriorating weather. Uh, here's the aircraft. Notice the observation right below that. Here's the winds, 310, 25, gust of 34 knots, 10 miles, visibility, few clouds at 23, temperature 32, dew point 22, altimeter 3002. Remarks, A01. What does A01 mean in that observation? that there's no precipitation discriminator. I'm not going to tell you what weather is occurring at the field. But what's TSNO? Thunderstorm sensor not operating. So I can't tell you there's a thunderstorm there. And then look at the damage on the airplane. Now, overall, it doesn't look too bad, but look at the vertical stabilizer. Look at the wings. And again, we have substantial damage. Luckily, no fatalities or no serious injuries but a scary landing. And again, think about that. Full power, airplane still going down, hits, flipped inverted, there's the accident. This is prior to takeoff. There's the radar image, and you can, you can see the land there. Here's at the time of the accident. Good time to go flying? How long would it have taken to do a pre-flight to kind of look at the radar, local area? Hey, we're going to wait it out. Uh, in this case, pushing a bad situation didn't pay off. We start talking about low ceilings visibility. Again, big area of impact with Part 91 fatal accidents. Instrument meteorological conditions prevail in a lot of them. We have instrument rated flights, loss of control, spatial disorientation, ice and turbulence, thunderstorms, failure to adhere to standard instrument approach procedures, and again, the good old one, VFR and IMC conditions. 
And to give you an example of a perfectly case of this, again, back in Sanderson, Florida, July, RV7. And we have a non-instrument rated pilot departing in a morning VFR cross country flight to pick up his girlfriend in Kentucky, bring her back to Sun City, beautiful retirement community. No flight planned, no pre-flight weather planning. Departure and destination or VFR, let's go flying. Well, here's the synoptic conditions, and you'll notice the map up here. I've got a, a frontal wave, low pressure system, a little stationary front, trough of low pressure. You notice all the echoes across southern Georgia, northern Florida. We've got thunderstorms. There's the local observation closest to where the accident's going to occur. Stationary front, convective activity. In this case, the pilot's going to encounter thunderstorms, low ceilings visibility, reported by the witnesses. And here's what the radar looked like. You'll notice as he's traveling north, north, west here, he comes across that line of weather. What does he do? He starts paralleling it. Now, does he have any outs here? Look at, oh, Gainesville, right to the east, uh, southeast, or southeast there. Good alternate, maybe to go take a landing and take a look at what's going on. But no, we're going to press forward. And he almost goes into a box canyon here. Basically, storms are per around him 360 degrees. He's closed off, and he decides to push back northward again. Here's a close-up in the actual flight track of the lines of the dots there every 10 seconds. And basically, we decide to punch through, and it doesn't pay off. And again, no flight plans filed. So it's days before we find out, geez, he didn't show up. I don't know what's going. He didn't even call me. Several days later, we find the airplane. And again, in this case, not much is left. Uh, that's a typical VFR and IMC condition accident. Uh, Pre-flight planning, critical to kind of look at your environment, see what's going on, and make good plans. I hate to say, though, in about 41% of the accidents we've looked at, we do see that either a weather briefing is not obtained or it's inadequate. There's, he never got the adverse weather, that there's an airmet for IFR conditions, convective segment there. Pre-flight planning is critical. Now, we've got an automated flight service station, 1-800 weather brief. We've got direct users access terminals. We've got the internet sources, National Weather Service ad site, private vendors, WSI, four flight, flight plan, you name it, they're out there pushing their wear. But there's only two formally recognized, i.e. when there's an accident that occurs, I call FA duets, I can get a record of what was provided, i.e. what was there, was it properly forecast? The other sources, I don't know. I do contact a lot of these, but now it's a hunting game trying to find out what the pilot knew about the conditions. Uh, was he prepared for it? Did he carelessly uh, operate into it? I don't see too many careless and reckless people purposely flying into thunderstorms. Usually there's a sequence of events that's occurring here, but again, we want to know what's going on. Internet's a great source. iPads, great source, but we need to know you got a briefing. Um, when you start getting briefings, critical to get the adverse weather, the uh, synopsis, the big picture, where are the boundaries, what's going to influence the flight, current conditions, in route forecast, pyreps, destination forecast, forecast, alternate planning, always have an out, i.e., VFR and IMC conditions. If you do encounter IMC conditions, what are you going to do? Have a plan. Make a hamburger stop. Um, Winds aloft, what's the freezing level? Critical to know what that is. Notice the airmen, update your forecast. Now this is critical, because you're probably not aware of this, but forecasts are not always perfect. Get an update, always think. We see National Weather Service is typically slow in forecasting onset of low IFR, IFR conditions, fog. They're not too good at that. Safety tip. Get a big picture. I want you to all make sure your point. When you go out and fly, you look at the conditions. What's going on? Here's an example of the National Weather Service Aviation Weather Center, their ad site, aviationweather.gov. 
you can tailor this image, official National Weather Service data. You get graphic text information. You can customize this, this display, put a radar, your satellite flight categories, color coded to tell you where things are, IFR, low IFR, marginal VFR, VFR, PIREPs, clearly indicated. Here's just looking at the observations, pulling up the observations, PIREPs, radar. Get the big picture. Here's the low level SIG weather prog, 12, 24. Notice the boundaries and notice the green areas associated with them where we're talking about rain showers, thunderstorms. They start shading when they're talking about 50% coverage and greater. Get a plan, get your out, plan your flight accordingly. Hey, uh, weather's gonna be an impact to go through here. We're gonna wait, wait it out, makes good solid plans. Those charts go out through seven days now. Great planning to get an idea. And you'll notice the main frontal systems, the boundaries are where we see our concentrated thunderstorm and rain shower activity, IFR, low IFR conditions. So we want to look at them. Observation page, if you go to the Weather Service, they go to the air, uh, aircraft reports, PIREPs, METARs, ceilings, visibility. You can mouse over them, get the information. Here's an example of a PIREP just this week from a Falcon 50 departing regional southwest at 16,000 feet, reporting extreme turbulence. Now, what's extreme turbulence? You're along for the ride and they're likely going to see substantial damage. Radar pages are great. We've got a radar mosaic updated every 10 minutes. We've got regional displays on the bottom right there, individual radar sites. You click on the site, you can get base or composite radar reflectivity. You go to the bottom for the radar coded messages to give you basically echo tops and uh, movement. This is the base reflectivity image at an individual site. Here's the composite image showing you all the different scans, kind of showing you the whole things, weather watches and so forth are on there, critical. Radar uh, coded message chart, and again, movement. Oh, don't worry, we've got a bonanza, we can get over that, what, 56,000 foot top? Jeez, uh, I think almost every airplane out on the flight line may have a problem getting over that one. But these things is critical information. Satellite images, the same thing. We have infrared, visible moisture channel, critical information to get you. Highly recommend getting AC0045 Gulf. It's the basic reference guide on how to read and interpret all the National Weather Service products. And for your information, CFIs, it's required knowledge in almost every flight check you do, biannual and so forth. Now, on the bottom there, I've got the website where you can download it as a PDF, put it into your computer as necessary, or you can go to Glen, uh, go purchase it through Sporty's Pilot Shops. But again, critical Bible on how to use and interpret all these weather products. I will show you some symbols I want you to start thinking about and show you something. Another great source that pilots need to be looking at right now is AC0024 Charlie on thunderstorms. It's been updated last year. And basically, it's kind of talking about uh, ground-based weather radar use, the WSR-88D, the next reds. Uh, it talks about reflectivity and echo intensities, the DBZs, the decibels. They're doing away with that old level one through six VIP levels. They want you to know and understand the DBZ scale by themselves. We start talking about clear air and precip modes, base and composite reflectivity, flight planning, use of this data, weather in the cockpit displays. And the key point, weather in the cockpit is not live radar. There's a delay, time lag, big limitation if you're going to use it. Airborne weather radar use, minimum 20 mile avoidance, and again, attenuation issues. And again, the critical do's and don'ts of flying in thunderstorms. This was updated due to several recommendations from the NTSB due to thunderstorm encounters that we found that pilots weren't aware of certain terms, critical information. Now, this is a, a, a nice chart, critical to kind of show you what's going on with radar. If you'll notice on the far right, that's the National Weather Service scale for the WSR 88Ds, where we're seeing like 16, 17 reflectivity levels. The three private weather vendors who distribute all that weather radar, that's their scales. You notice they don't quite match up 
If you turn your attention to the center, airborne weather radar and anything being uplinked, what they recommend those levels to be. Notice the center, airborne, I start showing echoes at 20 to 30 dBZ, that's light, moderate 30 to 40, and a greater than 40 dBZ, as I show is uh, heavy activity there. But notice when you start looking on the far right, do those scales match? If I'm looking at ground-based weather radar, if I pull out my iPod right now and start looking at that radar, I'm going to be starting to see some yellow, some orange. What would I be seeing that in the cockpit? Red. Does that make a big difference to you? Think about it. What you see is yellow on the ground is going to be red, and you may not see that purple, the other darker colors. Notice the scale on airborne doesn't show the high side, but notice it doesn't show the low side either. Now, those of you, how many guys here are instrument rated? Okay. You're flying IFR, and we got the Center of Weather Service support here. Uh, all ATC have basically warp displays. Here's ATC's radar display in the far left, where they're going to go to four precip levels. We've got light, moderate, heavy, and extreme. They only show moderate and heavy. Do they match to our scales? Color scales definitely don't match. But you notice they don't start showing any activity till 30 decibels. I, so all what you'd see is light green on airborne. They're not going to show, but they do show the heavier activity. But again, anything real intense extreme, we've got deficiencies there. It's not designed to do what the National Weather Service is trying to do with Warren with that tornadoes and severe weather. So there's a difference in scale. The, the scale of what you see on the ground may not match what's in the cockpit, and it's not going to match what ATC is. But you need to know those reflectivity levels and, again, the limitations. And, of course, when we start talking about thunderstorms, this is critical. Now, one of the first things that we start talking about thunderstorms, all your hazards are mixed up in one entity. Low ceilings, visibility, uh, tornadoes, uh, wind shear, microbursts, gust front impacts, icing. Every thunderstorm applies severe to extreme turbulence. Every thunderstorm applies severe icing. Every thunderstorm has hail. Only 3% ever reaches the surface. Watch your hail size. The bigger it gets, the bigger the updraft, and what goes up must come down. We get low ceilings visibility, altimeters, lightning. Every thunderstorm has lightning, and again, uh, kind of signposts in the sky, if you will. Engines work with fuel-air mixture, not water. When you start adding heavy water concentrations, we do see cases of engine flameouts. Now, this is an old picture showing a cross-section through a squall line. I kind of like to show it because it's got critical information here. Uh, anytime you hear the word line of thunderstorms, you should perk up. Why? Airborne weather radar is designed to avoid isolated cells. When you start talking about areas and lines, signposts, you have a limitation. Notice the front side of the storm where the updraft and the downdraft interact. The leading edge is typically the most severe part of that storm. And you notice in this case, I've got like a little lip coming down. That's the shelf cloud or roll cloud, signposts in the sky. But notice what's underneath that. The outflow, that cold, dense air coming down, spreading out around the surface and going ahead of the storm kind of help the lifting, if you will, but that can exceed the storm by 15 to 20 miles. So I could be shooting the approach, and all of a sudden I see the shelf cloud, and I'm going to start to get severe extreme turbulence and get thrown into the ground before I get even into the storm. Into the storm, notice where I have the microburst. It's going to be near the high reflectivity core in the main precip area, not ahead of it, but again, critical. Um, here's what a shelf cloud may look like. And again, warning, if you see this, you're shooting the approach, come and get ready to land, better have that hand on the power and ready to make a decision. Any sign of wind, you need to push the throttles forwards, go around, because this is going to get you. That's an indication of potential gust front outflow. Now, here's a picture of a severe storm in the Midwest. 
If you look at the top portion of this photograph, it shows a main intense cell, very strong cumulative appearance going up highward all the way up to the tropopause. Notice the anvil, how thick it is. Strong, thick anvil. But that main core of that storm is about 20 miles wide. Look at the anvil. That's going another 20 miles out, maybe up to about 40, 60 miles downstream. The bottom part is showing you the reflectivity. You notice you can see the heavy reflectivity side on the, on the right. Look at the top. You can almost see activity going up and down uh, at high altitude. And if you look underneath the anvil, you can see some activity going there, little green echoes coming out underneath. What do you think that is? High likelihood that's hail. Hail does not show up good on radar unless it's wet. And when you get strong storms, it's spinning that hail and shucking it out. You could get a hail strike underneath that anvil, clear the, the storm. Look at the surface. Underneath near the main core, I see like what we call like an ant eater um, tongue sticking out looking for ants. That's a sign of a microburst. And if we look way out to the left on that, you notice I'm seeing signs of a gust front, but look how far away that is. That's like 20 miles in that picture. We're 20 miles out in advance of that storm, I'm seeing a turbulent, low-level flow. On radar, on the WSR-88Ds, we can see that sometimes. We call it a fine line or a thin line. Notice the real light reflectivity echoes, like 5 to 10, B, 10 dBZ there, spreading out and around the storm. That's in the signature of a gust front. Now, are you going to see that in cockpit weather displays? What do we show? Uh, airborne radar, what, 20 dBZ? Notice that's all below what you're going to see on airborne or in cockpit weather. What about ATC? Oh, they only show 30 dBZ and greater. You're not going to see it. You may see it on your iPad, but you're not going to see it on typical stuff approved for flight. Big limitation, big warning. This is what a gust front looks like. Looking at modeling, looking at that strong, cold, dense air, interacting with the warm air. Look at the vortices. Think about going to the beach where waves are getting violent, crashing. Imagine your airplane coming into approach and impacting that. And we do see cases and continue to see cases with um, Turbulence impacts from gust fronts. Here's an example of one in uh, uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, with a King Air. April 4th, 2008, approaching airport at 3,000 feet underneath the shelf cloud, counter severe turbulence and loss of control, where he loses several hundred feet before regraining. Now, geez, does that, we call that severe turbulence when you lose control of an airplane? That's extreme turbulence. Loses several hundred feet, able to gain control, full power flying out. There's the observation underneath it. Looking at the radar to this, and again, we do see structural damage to the spar, so it is an accident. Uh, there was a squall line west of the airport and a fine line of echoes right in the vicinity where this encounter occurred. And here we have a professional flight crew, good airplane, and again, luckily not a fatal event, but again, a close event. Uh, here's a particularly sad one I worked on um, back in the, uh, the summer, June 18, 2009, in Texas with a uh, uh, married couple, husband and wife flying team, love flying team, uh, both private pilots. They're going to VFR cross country. And of course, the destination right when we get there, it's nighttime. They're going from Southwest Houston to Plainville, Texas. Um, no weather briefing, no flight plan filed. Uh, we do have one of the pilots calling to get an update on weather 2140. Here's the weather they receive. Winds uh, 18 gusts to 33, two and a half miles in thunderstorm and heavy rain. Notice the really the ceiling, 5,000 feet. These are high base thunderstorms here. Um, big impact. Uh, aircraft found two days later in a soybean field. Uh, witnesses uh, reported blowing dust, sand, high gusting winds, 60, 70 miles uh, per hour at the time of the accident. Um, and of course, it is a fatal event. But here's what the synoptic conditions look like. And here we are going from Houston. It looks like a clear blue sky, clear skies, warm, moist air coming from the Gulf. What's that dashed line there? What's an outflow boundary? 
An outflow boundary is the same thing as saying a gust front. I've got thunderstorms behind it, but look at this, the full extent. It's almost like a dry line out in Texas, but there is a, a boundary right there, and Jesus knows how it matches up perfectly in the accident. Here's what the radar looked like, and here's their flight track I overlaid it. And you'll notice that they're going north, and all of a sudden they, just, they see something out there. Their, their destination airport's uh, just off the screen uh, on the upper left side. Lubbock is down here uh, almost due west of the accident site, and there's the uh, Lubbock observation at the time. BLDU, something we don't see here in Florida. What is that? Blowing dust, winds gusting at 51 knots. You maybe you could see why they decided not to continue going westbound. But they go north, making like a little horseshoe racing pattern, um, and then finally head back north again. They start turning back eastward, and all of a sudden turn around back again, go to the west, and right at that time, the last track is matches exactly with that radar image. What is this big blue line right there? That's that fine line indicating where the outflow boundary is, the thunderstorms. And of course, where they went to it, they started at 6,000 feet, uh, elevation's 3,000. So at about 3,000 foot elevation, the last radar hit had them down at about 4,200 feet. I think that could have been part of the storm impact. Um, but again, 3,000 feet up, thrown to the surface. That's likely what they would have seen during daylight hours and likely what they saw approaching the airport. But again, nine minutes earlier, sun finally set uh, and the beginning of civil twilight started. So it was official night at the time of the accident. But again, that's likely what they had flown into. That's the accident site. One of the farm hands making a trip out to the soybean field, thought a shed had blown out in the field. They went out there and that's what they found. Not a lot of clues left in weather-related accidents. Probable cause, continued flight in adverse weather, uh, lack of pre-flight planning and so forth. So it could have been avoided. Again, when they saw something, they could have diverted, made a good choice, but they're pushing a bad situation. Another uh, perfect case in July in Rantoul, Illinois. Personal IFR flight with a Malibu. Internet weather briefing. Files an IFR flight plan. They're going from Rantoul to Sarasota. In a hurry to beat the weather is what they told the line service guy and the cashier as they checked out of the FBO. Basically, they take off. There's a loss of control on takeoff, and down comes the airplane, fatal to three people, husband, wife, and their oldest daughter. Featured in Flying Magazine back in uh, January uh, 2013. If you still got your magazine or go search it, you can get a little description of it, or again, go to our NTSB webpage. Um, again, what's the synoptic condition? Geez, the accident site's going to be right in, what's this line with two dots colored red or purple? Anyone recognize that? Squall line. That's the standard symbol for a squall line. How many CFIs do we have in here? Is it a good thing to teach our students what a squall line is? Bad thing, right? Bad, don't fly, squall line. Here we have a squall line approaching the airport, approaching the airport, approaching the airport. Oh, let me go back one here. This is what the daughter took on her cell phone as they're fueling the airport airplane on the left, what's this rolling cloud coming towards them? There we are, uh, rolling down for takeoff, going out, taxing out. There's, notice that cloud, where is it? Almost on, right on top of the airport. Here's what the radar animation looked like. You can see the accident site. What do you think that little blue line is right there? That's that fine line, the indications where the gust front is. And of course, because of the position where the radar is, the airport, I couldn't depict it right overhand, but you can see right when it moves through the airport right there, that was the gust front going through before the heavy rain, before the thunderstorm officially arrives. We had a gust front go through right at the time of takeoff. 
airplane wobbles, and down they go in three fatal event. And again, not much left of the airplane. And again, three people innocently killed. And again, lost control during takeoff. Again, big factor is the thunderstorm outflow. But initially, again, you're seeing loss of control, the big theme. Local another flight back in March, uh, personal flight to Miami to Deland. This pilot's doing everything right. He sees, gets a briefing. He's uh, diverting because it's a solid line of weather between him and his destination in Deland. So he lands in Titusville. He lands, he's taxing in, and all of a sudden, boom, wind gust to 52 knots, five minutes before the rain. What does that tell you? It was the gust front coming through and substantial damage to the airplane. It also blew a hangar door right off its hinges. Probable cause, lost control of the airplane while taxing and gusting wind conditions, and also associated with the nearby thunderstorm. Now, this is a, a, a great shot. It's beginning signs of a microburst. Uh, if you go online, you're going to be able to probably downplay this. I, uh, we're having problems to displaying it, so it's not going to play right now. I apologize for that. But uh, microbursts do still occur. We are seeing events. Here's one in April in Daytona Beach, uh, an instructional flight. Aircraft just landed, beating the weather. They're taxing to the ramp when thunderstorms impact the field. Aircraft is violently flipped over, inverted, substantial damage. ATC's broadcasting a microburst alert at the time. Wind gusts of 50, uh, 48 knots, gusting of 64 knots occurring at the time. Substantial damage to the airplane, two shaken but uninjured pilots, but they're lucky. What, what basically saved them right there is they're already on the ground. What do you think they would have happened if they were on approach or in the air? So they're lucky, but again, bad news in the fact that we have uh, substantial damage. And again, almost the same thing, structural damage of the wing as well as the vertical stabilizer. Here's the radar, and basically right at the time of the uh, accident, we have a very intense, large cell. An average thunderstorm is like only five miles. If you look at this thing, that thing's extensive. Now, I've got a radar animation I'll play real quick, but I want you to kind of notice which way the storms are moving or the thunderstorm echoes in the one that's going to occur. I'm going to play you 90 minutes of radar. Updating four and a half minutes here. Now think about this. An average thunderstorm only lasts 20 minutes in the mature state. Notice that echo coming like um, right over the field. Does it change shape intensity in 90 minutes? No, that's a steady state. So that's actually what we probably are looking at as a supercell. You notice some of the other echoes? Notice that they're moving more northeastward. Notice this one's moving to the right of the upper level winds. It's because it's got a mesocyclone. It's moving, rotating to the right, and maintaining its intensity for 90 minutes as it goes across the airport. And again, classic microburst. Another example kind of showing you current activity. Here's a, a short impact of a, uh, a thunderstorm. Again, microburst, here's what we're getting with the observations. Again, almost similar uh, substantial damage. Here's the radar, and again, right at the time, a pulse thunderstorm right over the field. Here's the animation of it. Notice right as it's coming up, it rapidly develops and is gone. It goes up, comes down, dissipates. Classic microburst, or what we call a pulse thunderstorm, creating short bursts of hazardous weather. And again, uh, luckily no fatalities, but again, luckily they were on the ramp at the time. Now, to give you another good example of another impact, uh, kind of showing you in route phase, this is a King Air back in uh, Great Tennessee back in June 2011. We've got airborne weather radar. We're deviating around weather at 20,000 feet. We're in IMC conditions. Uh, we have lost control, uncommand roll and dive. At 20,000 feet, regain control at 8,000. We got substantial damage to the spar. Um, we got two uninjured but very shaken pilots. Here's what they flew through. And first, if you look at the top right, we got a little frontal occlusion right there. 
There's the radar on the bottom looking at the large scale. Notice the little red star in the far right of that. You notice that overall on the radar, what he's going to encounter is nothing compared to what's out there that day. On the left here, I'm kind of showing a display of the radar track, the image at that time, corrected at his altitude. And we're going to fly right into a small developing cell and boom, upset at 20,000 feet. Here's a close-up and showing you all reflectivity. And again, remember, what, under 20 dBZ, are you going to see that light blue echoes? Now, when you start talking about thunderstorms, I've got large droplets, and at 20,000 feet, what do you think the temperature is? Minus 10, minus 15 in this case. Large droplets, super cool large droplets. The aircraft's getting moderate to severe icing at the time. Flies over us, 35 to 40 dBZ echo that's punching up, and it helps initiate the upset. Plus, the icing, does your airplane operate normally with ice? Is it cleanly stall? No, we typically see rolls. Combination of ice, some super cool large droplets, turbulence, and we have a major upset. Luckily, no fatalities. Here's the damage. Look at the uh, horizontal stabilizer. A third of it taken, torn off on the left side. The other side, notice how it's bent downward. Uh, significant damage, here's the uh, whole tail. And if we kind of look at it even close, you can almost see the wrinkle. They're lucky that whole tail didn't separate in flight. Just from a, a small encounter with a small developing echo. We've got ATC uh, safety alert out, basically kind of say, hey, solicit ATC. Tell them what you know about the weather. Ask for their help. Get them to provide responses. Um, we have had major improvements where ATC, if they've got radar display, they should, by procedure now, provide you what they're seeing on the echoes. Now, in this case, this is the Gulf of Mexico Part 135 flight going from McKinney, Texas to Tampa, uh, equipped with airborne weather radar. He's got storm scope for lightning, as well as XM uh, satellite weather, next rad. He's gotten multiple briefings. He's anticipating deviating around the weather but something goes wrong, and we have five fatal people in this event. Here's the airplane prior. There's the weather scenario. Notice the little, what's this dash line right here? A trough of low pressure extending out over there with a lot of convection, and I'm kind of going, I'm, the flight is gonna be operating from Texas, going across this area, cut across right there. Now, um, Here's what the satellite image, what the flight track is, and again, the convective activity. There is a SIGMET out, and it basically is just for an area thunderstorms moving east at 25 knots, tops to 45,000 feet. But uh, this one is unique in the fact that uh, I, there's sound, a great soundtrack with this you can get on live ATC. Um, and usually I overlap it with the sound, but we don't have time to go through the 10-minute uh, the audio, but basically he comes down, he's, he's been approved, approved deviations due to weather, ATC provides him, hey, I've got moderate, heavy to extreme precipitation, uh, next 60 miles ahead of you, deviations approved. He starts penetrating into the weather right here, and as he's penetrating, he goes, hey, uh, I'm getting quite a bit of turbulence right here. He comes back, I'm getting a 2,000 foot per minute descent rate at full power. Uh, and turbulence, uh, ATC, what do you want to do? Do you want to turn back? Affirmative, I want to turn back. He decides to make a turn and goes right into it. The horror of this audio clip is the pilot comes on, mayday, 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 we're inverted and we're going down. God help us. And after this, you hear everyone else, you know, everything's quiet for a minute, like, what just happened? And everyone then starts to ask, uh, it'll be more like a 20, 30-mile deviation around that weather. Um, but again, big impact. ATC did their job. But are you going to get through thunderstorms at 15,000 feet? 
even with all the tools, airborne radar, live radar, XM, delayed images, as well as storm scope, uh, he made a bad decision in this case. And again, you could argue, well, maybe you should have stayed straight and, and minimized the exposure, not increase the bank angle. Uh, but again, conditions were getting bad, and he made a bad decision. And we have five people fatal with it. One of the key things in my briefing I want you to make sure is you get an update on your weather briefing. Safety, again, better to think about it on the ground than worry about it up here. But again, update your briefing. Uh, weather changes. Uh, another sad story back in December 2011. This one is in the AOPA Air Safety Foundation uh, live web presentation, so you can go back and get this. The sad part of this is the family flight, as you can probably uh, see. Uh, private pilot, instrument rated, total time less than 400 hours, 14 hours actual instrument time. Uh, it's a night IFR cross. He's going from Hampton, Georgia to Waco. No documented weather briefing. He's equipped with a Garmin 696 with XM uh, satellite weather. Enter at 8,000 feet, request deviation or other round weather looking for a hole. And again, ATC provides, I show you heading right into heavy weather now, suggest you turn back. And again, the proud father here, all of a sudden, okay, we're, we're turning right now, we're in some bad weather, I'm trying to get out of it, followed by loss control, in-flight breakup, and family of five taken out. And sad event, here's the synoptic conditions at the time. You'll notice the accident site, and right here, it says an outflow boundary right there. Out, what's an outflow boundary? Associated with the thunderstorms, the gust fronts. And here's the radar animation. Now, if you look at that animation, it really doesn't look all that exceptional, surprising. But in this case, it's enough to cause problems, and in which case, there's the actual aircraft. And again, violently tossed about, overstressed, and down they come. Here's what XM satellite showed him at the time, and right at that time period is the image he was likely using. Right here is the image what he likely saw, and here he is deviating, trying to get around it, and trying to go right back into it, and there's the accident site. That's what was being displayed right at the time of the accident. This is what uh, ground-based weather radar showed right at the time of the image is that image right there. Do, you, do that look like the same image? A little bit different. Different, different display, a little bit of a time lag, but he actually flew in through a strong part of the storm that he did not clearly see with uplinked weather. Encounter with weather, the left wing failing, uh, contributing factors, of reliance on uh, in cockpit weather. And just as a quick little point here, this is one of the displays for uh, weather in the cockpit kind of showing, hey, we're going from Orlando, going up to Ocala here. Here's what the radar image shows. This image was created at 1530. That doesn't mean that was the radar exactly then, but at 1530, that's what they're displaying. The clock here says at 1541. Now, right off and I'll throw to you, that radar display has likely already been updated on the ground three to five times. So in that 11 minutes plus, by the time we got that image up there, I've already had up to five updates easy on my radar display. Would you want to make cutting in and out of these storms on radar data that's 15, 20 minutes old? We have an advisory circular out kind of warning about the hazards of relying on this. There is time lag uh, delay on cockpit weather radar. It's a great tool, don't get me wrong, but do not make tactical decisions based on it. It's strategic planning only. There's a time stamp, and again, I want you to put it in your back of your mind that that's 20 minutes old when you time you get it as a quick reference. And again, here's another one from February, uh, February 14th, the Flying Magazine. Again, another aircraft going through in the weather, low time. What's this line with two dots colored purple? 
critical get a weather briefing. Here we got a squall line, and again, trying to push a bad situation uh, in an in-flight breakup. Here's the radar, and again, here's the accident site. Here's the actual uh, flight path and what the cockpit weather. Again, notice the displays don't match, and in this case, they only hit to the leading edge. Where's the strongest part of that storm? Where the updraft, downdraft interaction, leading edge, they just touched the beginning of the side of that echo, had the upset, and down they came. And again, we have a fatal event. A lot of these weather-related accidents are avoidable. And again, look at your signposts in the sky. Use your tools. Okay, If something's creating lightning, what do you know what it is? It's a thunderstorm. Um, make good decisions. This is where I tell the guys, guys, listen to your wife. Okay? Um, Wives get in, active in here, but again, don't push a bad situation. Get an update. Uh, make good, sound decisions. Uh, again, remember, a lot of our weather-related accidents are avoidable. We look at the man, machine, the environment. Sometimes Mother Nature can be very mean and cruel. You need to kind of use good level heads, good planning decision from pre-flight. Disciplined updating your weather even if it's an ipad use it however do not use that weather data for penetration even airborne weather radar is designed to avoid cells not to penetrate them with that in mind uh if you have any other questions uh, um uh, i'll throw it to you if you, you like the presentation you want to see something like that the best way to get in hold of me is my email it's it's E-I-C-K, Ike D, at NTSB.gov. That's what I have, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions you may have.